our message this evening is going to take a little bit of a seasonal twist to it. We're going to talk about Christmas hope. And I want for you to think uh, as we begin our message about the subject of hope. And what does hope mean? What does it mean to have hope? Uh, we're going to use this as our scripture text, Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 38. Uh, this is a small part of the Christmas narrative that we find in Luke's gospel. This is the part that we always skip over and that we never hear about. It uh, is the part really that follows the Christmas story. And it is the, the, the account of Simeon and Anna who uh, encounter the newborn babe in the temple following the birth of Christ. And we're going to begin reading with verse 25. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 2. You'll read, be reading verses 25 through 38. Let's begin reading. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the, the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, the light for the revelation of the Gentiles, and for the glory of her people, Israel. The child's father and the mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the son of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, she was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after their marriage, after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. What is the hope? of Christmas. I got on the internet this past week and I just typed in the hope of Christmas. You would not believe some of the things that are associated with hope and Christmas. We just come through a long political uh, season and there was a lot of talk. How many of you recognize hope as one of the primary words that we heard again and again that you know we, we want change and we need change because we're hope, we, we, have, we have hope for better things in the future. Um, though there was lots of talk about hope, I, I never really heard anyone concretely define for me what it was that was being hoped for. Now typically when we think of hope and the Christmas season, what, what, what do we associate with hope and Christmas? Ponies. What? <laughs> Ponies! <laughs> Or Ben, maybe in your household it would be a rabbit. <laughs> Another rabbit. <laughs> yeah, we, we hope to get such and such as a, as a present. Um, we, we hear people say, well, I bought such and such this present. I hope it's the right size. Or I hope it's the color that you like. That's the way that we, we tend to use Hope. For many, hope and, and Christmas is more like a shopping list. They hope that they bought the right thing or will receive the right thing. But when we refer to hope and Christmas in the context of the Bible, what is it that we're referring to? What is it that we, we're, we're talking about? We're going to talk about that tonight in the first part of our message, and then we're going to talk about what that hope causes us to do. Now, I want to, I want to clarify one thing. Uh, before we move into the body of, of our, our message. And that is that Christmas only has significance because of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Without the cross, the manger is only an empty holiday symbol. If you only know the babe of Bethlehem, then all you have is an empty symbol for a holiday. You don't know what it really means to have hope that comes in, in the sense that Christmas hope was intended. But in connection with the cross, the manger becomes not just a symbol of hope. It becomes a, a symbol of hope that is divine in nature. Let's talk about what Christmas hope is. What is Christmas hope? I got the Webster's Dictionary out, and uh, by way of definition, hope is simply put this, it, 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 to, to cherish a desire with anticipation. To cherish a desire with anticipation. I hope my parents will get me a BB gun for Christmas. Yeah, you're too dry out. Um, we, we use this word. Uh, you know, someone buys a lottery ticket and they say, I hope that it's a winner. In fact, when you get right down to it, the way that we use hope um, is, is used in a popular sense in such a way that it really is a departure from the way that the New Testament uses the word. Uh, we hope that um, that uh, our favorite sports team wins the big game or wins any game. We, we hope that the sermon is shorter than it was last week. You know, we, we hope for a variety of things. And generally when we use this word, lots of times what we mean is it's just kind of wishful thinking. And it does not have any concrete expectation. Listen to me for a moment. This is important as you read your Bibles and as you study your Bibles, particularly in the New Testament. Whenever the word hope is used, and it's a hope that's grounded upon things that God promises, I like to see the word translated assurance rather than hope. The only thing that makes hope, hope, you know, in the sense of it's not a reality, is that it's yet to be fulfilled. But when our hopes are based upon what God is promising, that's not wishful thinking, that's an assurance. And so let's not confuse the hope of Christmas with wishful thinking. This isn't like the, the child's wish list. That's not Christmas hope. Christmas hope in the New Testament sense is the way that it's used in Romans the 8th chapter, verse 24, 25. Paul says, in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we eagerly wait for it. Paul says, yes, it's hope. And it's only hope because we don't have it yet. And we eagerly await for it, but what we wait for is based on God's promise, not just wishful thinking. The Christian concept of hope does not reflect uncertainty. It only reflects unfulfillment. Christian hope is not pie in the sky by and by. Christmas hope is not, oh, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. Christmas hope is based upon God's promise. Well, what is Christmas hope by way of scope? We tried to give you a, uh, a little bit of a working definition for what Christmas hope is. That is, it's, it's more akin to, to assurance that is, that is yet unfulfilled, but it's based upon God's promise. Now let's talk a little bit about the scope of Christmas hope. Everything that we are and aspire to become is affected by the hope of Christmas. It affects our today. Verse 26 of our text. The, uh, the prophet Simeon said, it had, it, uh, in reference to the prophet Simeon, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. The coming of, of the Christ child was the reason that Simeon found for living. We generally understand Simeon to be older in age. 
And he literally lived because he was waiting to see this promise fulfilled in his life. The Holy Spirit had specifically revealed to him that he was going to see the Christ child. Let me say parenthetically, just, just give you a little tidbit of information about the history that surrounded uh, the nation of Israel at this time. There, it wasn't just Simeon in the temple and Anna who were looking for the promised Messiah. There was an era of expectation in all of the Jewish people. In fact, did you realize that Jesus was a common name in the Bible? How many of you knew that? That Jesus was common. It's kind of like uh, Bob or Robert in, in, uh, in, our, in our day and age. Um, several years ago, we, uh, we had several baptisms on one Sunday, and I baptized three bobs all on the same day. Did you know that? I did that. Janet, do you remember that? Right. My son was one of them, Robert Luke, and uh, Robert Landrum, and Rob Landrum, all baptized on the same Sunday, all named Robert. Right. Robert is a common name. In Jesus' day, Jesus was a common name. Who knows what the name Jesus means? <coughs> Let's hear it. It's the same as Joshua. It's the Greek equivalent of, of the Old Testament Joshua. But what does it mean? The Lord saves. <coughs> Yeshua. And so when we say Jesus the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, it's the Lord saves, the Lord of the Christ. Why was Jesus' name common? Because there was this pure expectation. And so many Jewish mothers wanted their little boy to be the one through which God would save his people. And so one out of every four baby boys born at this time was named Jesus because of this era of expectation. They were living to see the promise come of, of the one who would, who would deliver Israel. When we serve the babe of Bethlehem as the Lord of our lives, he gives us reason for living each and every day of our lives. If we truly understand the meaning of Christmas, it affects the other 364 days of the year. For the person who really understands what Christmas month is about, Christmas is no longer just about December the 25th. Christmas becomes about every day of the year. I'm no longer caught up in the rat race of life attempting to, to futilely uh, you know, beat out my neighbor for the, the latest and greatest, the newest shiny thing, the, the, uh, the, the, the object of, of everyone's esteem. Life takes on new meaning, and rather than get caught up in what the world is caught up about, my life takes focus. Every day I seek to, to uh, live to please my God. Not only today, but tomorrow, I have reason for carrying on. Verse 26 of our text. We, we typically think of Simeon as an older man. And after seeing the Christ child, the Messiah, the anointed one, he speaks of being able to die in peace. Uh, Christmas is a difficult time of year for a number of people. Um, one of the, I, I had opportunity to talk with Brooke and Nathan Woods uh, this afternoon. That's how I learned about uh, the Bullock family and uh, the death, the tragic death of this young father. Leave, leaves behind a, a wife and, and I think a one or two year old daughter. And one of the things we talked about was that this will this will affect the way that they view the Christmas season for the rest of their lives. How do you deal with sadness, not just during the Christmas holiday, but any time of the year? Well, the fact of the matter is, if you have to do it on your own, without the help of uh, a God who cares for you, and a God who holds the eternity in his hand, I'm not sure that there is a way to effectively cope with things such as that. The hope that the Christian has in this life and beyond is the only reason that it can be given for carrying on sometimes. 
sometimes we, we can't say anything other than God is in control and, and he has my best interest at heart. If we are not able to say that, I don't know how some people carry on. And it's not just for today and tomorrow. Um, hope really affects our eternity. In all of eternity, Christmas hope is the hope of everlasting life and salvation. See, it's not just about a day on, on the calendar, a day in December. It's not just about you know, the family getting together and, and having family memories. The hope of Christmas is the hope of salvation in Jesus Christ. It is a hope for us. Verse 30 of our text, uh, Simeon says, For my eyes have seen thy salvation. The Jewish people looked for that deliverer, the salvation that would come through the promised child. And Simeon could declare that Jesus Christ was his salvation. And, and we have that same expectation. But he goes on to say in verse 32, A light of revelation to the Gentiles. Wow, the Jews didn't see that coming, did they? God was sending a deliverer. He wasn't a military deliverer. Wasn't the kind of Savior that they had expected. He was a Savior of much greater proportions. One that would affect our eternal destiny. And not just a, 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 a Savior for those who were part of the chosen people. He was a savior for everyone. Simeon was an Israelite. When he spoke of a light for the Gentiles, he was acknowledging the fact that Jesus Christ is the savior of the entire world. And most of us who have no Jewish heritage whatsoever, aren't we glad that the Lord loves not just the Jewish people, he loves us. And that he is a light not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. Christmas hope is hope for all. Not just segregated to a specific class or race or group of people. Not just a certain time in history. Christmas hope is for everyone. Christmas hope is today, tomorrow, and eternal. Well, if we really believe in this kind of hope, so what? You know, we always like to, to, to talk about the what's so, and that's what we've done to this point. That the idea that this is what Christmas hope is. But so what? I mean, how does that affect you and I? How does it make any difference in our lives? I want to suggest to you that there are appropriate responses to the hope of Christmas. That there are things that we should appropriately do because we really have a hope in this child that was born 2,000 years ago. We can't sit back and just remark that uh, it's a wonderful life and wow, the presents are great and the food is grand and let's all get together next year and do it all over again. It's bigger than that. Such a blessed hope calls for a response from God's people. Christmas hope should not leave us passive. We shouldn't be able to just say, yeah, Wow, made in the manger. That's Christmas hope. Yeah, yeah that's, that's good. That's good. It should elicit from us a specific response. Let me suggest to you three ways that we should respond. First of all, Christmas hope should make us wonder. Verse 33 of our text. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Christmas hope calls us to wonder. I imagine that part of the wonder that Mary and Joseph felt was the awesome thought that the Savior of the world somehow was, was this little baby that they were holding in their hands. That's, that's a pretty incredible sight. When you stop to think that 33 years later, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, as an adult would affirm his deity and say that he was one with the Father, God in the flesh. That's an incredible thing. I mean, all by itself, the incarnation is an incredible thing. But to think that at its beginning stages, 
Mary and Joseph would hold this tiny little baby and they could affirm this is Emmanuel, God with us. This is the Savior of the world. That, that truly was an astounding thing for them to be able to affirm. An important part of Christmas hope is the wonder of the Incarnation. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Not just a baby that we're celebrating his birthday. That's, that's comfortable, isn't it? It's comfortable to have stable and the, and the donkey and the sheep and the cattle and the, the, the shepherds there and Mary and Joseph and the little baby in the manger. That, that's all very comfortable to us. But when we start affirming that this baby would someday give his life for our sins, that this baby was indeed God with us, Emmanuel, that's astounding. That causes us to look at it and, and, and do a double take and say, God, how is that possible? Who would think that our Creator would come to earth and die for us? That makes us wonder. Christmas hope, the hope of eternal life through this little baby that one day would give his life for you and me, this causes us to marvel, to wonder. You know, I hope that one of the things that we do this Christmas season, I hope that we take some serious time out and just think what it is that we that we're celebrating it's so easy for us to get caught up in what the world does in the holiday aspects of it all the lights and the trees and the presents and the family and the, the driving to and from and this and that and the other thing that we miss out on an important part of the experience and an important part of the experience is sitting back and marveling that God would choose to come to earth in the form of an innocent little baby. So the first response that I want to suggest to you is that we wonder. We marvel at the amazing thing that our God has done. The second thing that I believe the hope of Christmas calls us to do is in verse 28 and 38. And that is worship. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. That must have been a wonderful, a wonderful sight to see this old man, maybe gnarled hands and bent over, taking the baby in his, in his hands. The baby that he had waited years and years to see. And he holds him up before God and begins to praise God. You know, I, I, I picture this gnarled little, little old man taking this baby in his arms, tears streaming down his face as he praises God that the, the promise that he had received has been fulfilled. Wonder is the beginning of worship. But our worship cannot stop there. As Simeon and Anna both bless God and they give thanks to God, it's a natural thing for us, at least it should be a natural thing for us to look at the babe in the manger and marvel at what God has done and then as a result, bless the Lord and praise the Lord and thank God for what he was doing to bring his son into the world. What we are doing here this evening is a result of Christmas. Do you realize that? Christmas is the coming of the Christ child. But that child gave his life on the cross for our sins, rose again on the third day. And we are here tonight as his disciples, his followers, worshiping him. We worship our God for the hope that he has extended to us through Jesus Christ. 
The third and final thing that Christmas hope calls us to do is to witness. To this point, it's all pretty innocuous. I can, I can even have kind of a Christmas experience by myself, wondering in the marvel of what God has done. And, and thanking Him, praying to Him, you know, singing carols and, and just praising God for the wonder of Christmas and the hope that we find in Jesus Christ. But I want to suggest to you tonight that it can't stop there. Verse 38 of our text says, And they spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Um, I have opportunity every now and then to be at the hospital. Usually it's not good. It's usually when people are ill. But um, I find myself oh, two or three times a year in an elevator with a father with balloons or flowers. Big old button. It's a boy. It's a girl. And it's interesting to see the willingness of that new father to talk about his baby. And, you know, whenever I see that, I'll, I'll, usually, I'll, I'll usually make some conversation about, is, is mom all right? Is the baby healthy? You know, and, and, and just to see that, that new parent just beam. I mean, you, it's, not, it's not like you're crying. I mean, they, they are more than, I mean, you know, you've got pictures and, they're, you know, they're, they're just, they're, they're just, just waiting for the opportunity to share about this little baby. I want to suggest to you that if we really realize what the hope of Christmas is all about, we should feel the same way about this little baby, Jesus Christ. That we shouldn't be content to keep it to ourselves. That when the opportunity presents itself, we ought to be all over that chance to, to say, this baby is not just a baby. This baby's my Savior. This baby isn't just the reason to, to give presents and put up a tree and kill a turkey. You know? This, this baby, this baby is is the Savior who gave his life on the cross. The babe of the manger is the Savior of the cross and the Lord of the empty tomb. With Simeon and Anna, their natural response to the blessed hope of Christmas was the burning desire to share it with everyone who was around them. So must our response be to the hope of Christmas. It's not enough that we know the blessing of Jesus, God in the flesh. It's not enough that we acknowledge Him as Savior of the world. It's not enough that in awe and wonder we marvel that God, the Creator, should humble Himself and take the image of His creation. It's not enough that we should worship Him. We must share the message of hope with a lost world. Folks, in each of our lives, there are people who celebrate Christmas, but they don't know what the hope of Christmas is all about. You have people at work who will give you a present or bring you cookies or send you a card. People who you talk to maybe on a day-to-day -day basis. They know who Jesus is, but they really don't know who Jesus is. They celebrate Christmas, but they never had someone take the opportunity and say, hey, listen, here's why Christmas is really so important. And I want to challenge you this Christmas season. Who is it in your life that celebrates Christmas but doesn't really know what the hope of Christmas is all about? Who is it that you can say to them, let me talk to you about the babe in the manger. Let me share with you why Christmas is really so important. Let me tell you what about Christmas you're missing out on 
Because if all you have is Christmas, and you don't have Easter, you, know, you, don't, have, you don't have Good Friday and Easter, you've missed out on the best part of what Christmas is all about. We must share the message of hope with the lost world. This Christmas, may the true hope of Christmas inspire us with a zeal to be his people. May it inspire us to wonder and marvel at what God has done in the incarnation. That's, that's really in a nutshell what Christmas ought to be about. But may we worship him in response. And may that worship, that that realization of what a blessing we have and what God has done for us, may it cause us to tell others about him. Witness to those all around us who are really being shortchanged with a Christmas season that doesn't look forward to the cross in the empty tomb. Let's bow.